Oh yeah, I see that live streaming service. That's the Zoom. Yes. I mean, that's the YouTube. That's the YouTube. Yeah. Great. And it looks like we are live on YouTube. I'm going to do a little audio check. That is working as well. For those who are on YouTube, welcome. We are just going to begin here in a couple of minutes. in person, I wait a few minutes after the hour to let everyone settle. Um, but that problem is pretty much resolved when it's all virtual. Exactly. All right, it is seven o'clock. Let's get this going. Um, good evening, everyone. My name is Kevin McCumber and I'm an MIT alumnus, class of 2005 undergraduate and 2011 PhD. I run food and beverage events for the MIT Club of Boston. And it is my pleasure to welcome you tonight to the Science of Chocolate presented by the MIT Club of Boston featuring Professor Michael Seema from MIT. So I just wanna start with a brief agenda for the evening. It looks like we have a little bit of a lag on YouTube. So hopefully the audio matches with the video over there. Um, tonight's agenda is pretty straightforward. I'll begin with some introductory remarks and then I'll turn the, the microphone over to Professor Seema to take us through the science of chocolate presentation he has prepared. And then we'll conclude with a question and answer session. I want to make clear that this recording tonight is going to be available on the MIT Club of Boston's YouTube channel. I'll be sending out an email to all registrants after the event with a link to that video. I'll also include a link to a survey as uh, we continually strive to improve our events and I would really appreciate it if you can take that survey and give us your feedback. There will also be a couple other links that you'll see in that email, which I'll mention as we go through the evening. And as you all know, tonight is free to attend. We do ask that for the value that you feel you've received from this event, that you make a donation to MIT's COVID-19 response funds. Um, I personally feel that if anyone is going to have a good shot at solving some of the myriad problems coming from the pandemic, it's going to be our alma mater. So thank you in joining me. Yeah, thank you for joining me in supporting MIT's COVID-19 response funds. If you'd like to ask a question tonight, we've tried to make it simple. We consolidated everything in a central platform. Please navigate to meet.ps slash MIT chocolate if you can't remember that link, that's okay. It should be in the email that you received as a confirmation for this event if you registered relatively recently, as well as in an email that I sent to you previous to the event. Um, and it's also in the um, description section of the YouTube event. Out there, you can submit your question. You can also view questions that others have submitted and you can click the little up arrow to vote up others' questions, and then I'll just cherry pick those and I'll pose them to Professor Seema during the Q&A. But you can feel free to ask questions whenever you'd like. Of course, we're limited in the time tonight, so we'll try to get to as many questions as possible and we appreciate your understanding 
if we're unable to get to your question over the course of the evening. A lot of things had to come together to make this event happen. And I wanted to thank a number of individuals and organizations. First, the MIT Club of Boston, the representation, uh, representative body for alumni in the Boston area for continuing to sponsor our food and beverage programs. I'd like to thank other MIT clubs across the country as well as internationally for helping to publicize this event and the Alumni Association, is, uh, especially Kim Hunter at the MIT Alumni Association for making sure that things run smoothly and that clubs are all communicating about events that we're putting on. I'd like to thank the New England Science Writers for making a financial donation to the MIT COVID-19 Research Fund in recognition of tonight's event. Of course, I'd like to thank Professor Seema for agreeing to do this event with us tonight. It's an honor to have him here. And I also like to thank Wendy Brown, Professor Seema's Senior Administrative Assistant for making sure that everything lined up on our calendars. And finally, I wanna thank you, all of you, my fellow alumni and our friends of MIT for joining tonight, taking time out of your lives. Uh, I've also received a number of very warm and heartfelt emails. Um, thank you for those, I do appreciate it uh, for the events that we run. Now, many of you might not be aware that this is actually not a one-off event. Uh, we do have a pretty robust food and beverage program going at the MIT Club of Boston. And I'd like to invite you to join our future events. So these are what we have lined up uh, to date. In mid-July, we'll be doing an Irish whiskey masterclass. And then in late July, a Scotch whiskey blending course. In early September, we're doing a rum masterclass with our fellow alumnus, Eduardo, Eduardo Bacardi, who is the sixth generation of the Bacardi family in Puerto Rico obviously from the namesake brand, but he's now with a small artisanal rum brand that he'll be telling us about. And in mid-October, a really exciting event featuring MIT alumni who are now working in the food and beverage industry, talking about their career paths and how MIT set them up for success there. So if these kinds of events are up your alley, I would encourage you to join our relatively new uh, Facebook group, the MIT Alumni Fine Spirit Society, and um, if you're not able to find that on Facebook, I'll be sending out a link to that group in the post-event email as well. Um, and just before we get to Professor Seema, I wanted to you know, just make a note about um, this series of events and the event tonight. You know, there's a lot of, um, a lot of things that are, I, I think, very heavy and concerning in the world today. And I hope that these events are a way for us to take a little break, a little bit of a respite, um, a little mini sabbatical, if you will, from some of the day-to-day -day, you know, that we uh, obviously uh, have weighing on all of us. So please just take the next couple hours, enjoy. I hope this is educational and I hope it's fun. With that, it's my pleasure to introduce Professor Michael Seema. Professor Seema and I met in 2002 when I was a sophomore in his kinetics course in material science and engineering. Um, a good way through the term, he gave a lecture on the kinetics of chocolate. It was a fascinating lecture. I hardly understood a thing, but it was fascinating. And uh, now uh, a full 18 years later, a couple months ago, actually, I was sitting on my couch enjoying um, a bar of dark chocolate and I got to thinking, I wonder if other MIT alumni might be interested in hearing Professor Seema's talk. Um, thought about it, slept on it that night, the next morning, I sent him an email at 10.14 a.m. And at 10.20 a.m., I had a very enthusiastic, positive reply. So if anything, this guy does not mess around, at least when it comes to chocolate. Um, so it is my pleasure to introduce Professor Seema, and I will turn the microphone over to you. All right, thank you. Let me uh, share my presentation. And I think it'll go this way. Uh, do you see the um, presentation? Yes, sir. We have it up. Yeah. Okay. So um, why chocolate? And uh, sort of Kevin alluded to this, uh, you know, why I ended up studying chocolate. It, I guess it's it summed up in one word, desperation. Um, you know, if you're teaching a, a materials kinetics class, toward the end of the term, uh, students get very busy. 
uh, they tend to not uh, have the uh, enthusiasm to coming to class and uh, they're trying to already start preparing for finals. And so I got the idea that, you know, maybe I should do something special towards the end of the term to, um, to keep their interests and uh, see an application that they hadn't thought of for the science we were studying. But the, uh, you know, that was many years ago. And uh, over the course of that time, I realized that there's a, another important reason. Um, and it has to do with uh, why I think students get an education, particularly an MIT education. And that is that they're working on three skills. And the three skills are curiosity, empathy, and leadership. And, uh, you know, why, why curiosity? Well, curiosity is curious people, I should say, are collecting solutions to problems they haven't encountered yet. And it's a skill that you need to develop. And it's one of the reasons why you take all these crazy courses in science and engineering while you're at MIT. The empathy part is about, I, the way I look at it is designing products, being able to get into the shoes of someone else and see the world in a different, different way. It's another skill to work on. And finally, the leadership part. And it, it's the part that we struggle the most with uh, at MIT, you know, how to, how to teach, how to expose students to leadership skills. And uh, it's something we've continued to work on. So chocolate stands right in the middle of that curiosity skill area. Now, the other person I want to mention here is Patrick Winston. It's been a long time since I've, that since I've given this lecture, um, maybe about four or five years. Five years, actually, was the last time I gave this lecture. And at least the five years before that, Patrick was always in the audience. Professor Winston uh, was a kind of institution himself at MIT, obviously a leader in, you might know him as a leader uh, in artificial intelligence, but he was also a very practiced person at Curiosity. And that's why he showed up at the chocolate lecture each year. Plus he really liked chocolate and he usually passed out verdicts. So he was always there. And in, in one of his, uh, recent missives uh, commenting on the popularity of artificial intelligence. He made the, the parallel that you see here that, you know, if you used, used to be, if you wanted to attract people to your webpage, you had chocolate somewhere in it because <laughs> somebody would be, would be Googling chocolate and pick up your webpage. Now it's artificial intelligence. So he's uh, definitely sorely missed at MIT and I'm, and I can't give this lecture without thinking about him. Now I'm gonna tell you a little bit about myself. Uh, I've been 34 years at MIT on the faculty. It's hard to believe. I have uh, joint appointments in the Department of Material Science and Engineering. I'm also at the Koch Institute for Integrative Cancer Research because pretty much all my research right now is, has to do with medical technologies. I'm an inventor. I uh, have lots of publications, well over 300 publications now. I'm a founder of several companies. I'm a member of the National Academy. Uh, I'm the MIT director, faculty director of the Glass Lab, which you probably remember from MIT. Uh, I work with uh, high school kids across the country through the uh, Lemelson MIT program. Uh, I'm now an associate dean of the engineering school, uh, specifically on innovation. So I'm co-director of the MIT Innovation Initiative. And I'm a father, 19-year-old and 16-year-old. Now, this all sounds really impressive, but um, it's about average at MIT. 
MIT for, for faculty members is a very humbling place to work because your colleague is always doing something astounding. And uh, so, I mean, that's really the thrill of working there. And uh, uh, so I've, I've just, you know, like I mentioned Patrick, I'll mention one other faculty member later. Uh, they've uh, been sort of inspirations to me. And um, it's great to work at a place where your colleagues are your inspirations. Okay, let's get into chocolate. Well, wait a minute. Uh, there's something I have to do. Speaking of Patrick Winston, some of you may remember Patrick Winston giving an IAP talk every year on how to speak. And uh, it was quite famous. It, it was uh, usually the last two or three days of IAP and it would absolutely fill 10 to 50. And you can find these on, on YouTube. I highly suggest you, you search it out and listen to Patrick because um, he gave uh, students a great list of things to think about when they present their work. And the first thing that you should do starting a talk is make a promise. And uh, so my promise to you, I give this, given this some thought about this talk, the obvious thing is you're, you're gonna learn at least one thing about chocolate that you didn't know before. And the, the second thing has to do with this, help you build curiosity skills because of that, your discovery of things that you didn't know that I guarantee you'll probably be able to use again, either in conversation or an invention. So cacao, um, as many of you know, it comes from the, the, the cacao fruit. Uh, Theobroma cacao is the species of which there are a number of varieties. In fact, the, the, the group, the genus Theobroma includes many different uh, plants. Uh, but Th Theobroma cacao, as we'll talk about, has a number of cultivars, uh, varieties. I mean, you can think of this as varieties of grapes, right? They, they are related but they're not exactly the same. And uh, genetically, they're not exactly the same. Uh, the fruit itself is highly compartmentalized and that's why I'm showing it here. You all know the cacao bean, which we will ultimately make chocolate from, uh, but you may not realize that one of the most important constituents of this in in the actual production of cacao is the pulp, which is the sort of gelatinous material that surrounds the bean. It's very sweet. And in fact, it, if you, uh, archeologists think that the, that the first reasons for cultivating cacao in the Americas was actually for the pulp. And I'll get to that in a second. But it's very compartmentalized. The, the bean or the seed it itself is composed of protein and fat that we'll get into uh, here in a moment because it's, it's really that fat component that's very important in actually making the chocolate. The other smaller constituents of the bean are also important in creating the taste. Um, these, you can see the sort of purple tinge to the center of the bean. These are phenolic compounds that the plant produces as a defensive mechanism. They're extremely bitter. It's, uh, while the pulp itself is sweet, uh, the, the bean itself, if you try to eat the raw bean, it's just unbelievably bitter. And 
these bitter agents consist of a number of different uh, phenolic components and other astringent type materials, uh, compounds that are there primarily as a defensive mechanism. <clears throat> Now I'll get into this, the, these, uh, the health effects, you know, I try, to, I try to include in this talk, over the years I've accumulated many questions and I've tried to accumulate, uh, you know, a couple of slides to answer those questions, but I get a lot of questions over the years about the health effects of chocolate. People wanna use it as an excuse to consume chocolate, I think, but, the, but is, are there really demonstrated health effects of chocolate and what are the what are the the types of physiologic or chemical effects the sort of pharmacology if you will of the of the of chocolate the one that people will constantly uh, pro point to is a compound called theobromine it is indeed a psychoactive agent uh, i'm going to talk about that here in a second uh, yeah, I got it right here. Uh, theobromine does not contain bromine. It, the name comes from the plant, the, you know, the, the, the species, uh, Theobroma cacao. They, because this was first isolated from the cacao plant, they gave it this name. Uh, it's very closely related to caffeine. You can see this one hydrogen is substituted with a methyl group to make give you caffeine. So you might expect very similar pharmacology to caffeine for theobromine. So let's talk about that for a second. Uh, so I've got, believe me, it's not a talk on pharmacology, but I get this question so, so often over the years that I thought I would give you a little bit of a, uh, a little bit of a tutorial on what pharmacological effects these, this particular psychoactive agent has. And uh, the story has to do with uh, the parts of your brain that have to do with putting you asleep. Um, it's a regulated process. So uh, your, the neurons in your brain uh, use an energy source, ATP, adenosine triphosphate. And in the course of metabolism, these cells ultimately degrade adenosine triphosphate into adenosine. Adenosine is shown here. Uh, it's uh, adenine bonded to a, a sugar residue to make adenosine. And uh, this is produced over the course of the day. And uh, because of the metabolic activity and uh, adenosine accumulates, in fact, it accumulates so much intracellularly that some is actually pumped out of the cell into the extracellular space where there are uh, proteins that line the surface of the cell specific proteins that are called the adenosine receptors, of which there are several different flavors. The A1 receptor, for example, A2A recept adenosine receptor. Um, these are the control mechanism for controlling when you feel sleepy. So the A1 receptor, when adenosine binds to it, actually promotes the feeling of being tired and better go to sleep. Uh, the A2A receptor is where people get a pretty hung up with chocolate and caffeine because they, uh, this is actually related to dopaminergic activity. So neuro neurotransmitters like dopamine and glutamate are actually regulated in part through this receptor. And uh, those, you know, these are uh, some uh, dependency mechanisms of other compounds are related to generation of dopamine. 
So when you have a lot of adenosine, this actually shuts down the activity of these uh, these neurotransmitters. It stops cells stop releasing them or slow down the production of, of these. So again, make you feel sleepy and you can rest and clear up all the junk that's accumulated in your brain. Now, uh, that's all fine. What does adenosine have to do with theobromine? Well, if you look at this part of the molecule and if I back up one, you can see it looks very similar to both these compounds. And so what happens with caffeine and theobromine is that when you ingest these, they do pass the blood brain barrier and they sit on these receptors and they, you would think, oh, they would make you sleepy. Mm, just the opposite. These compounds look like adenosine, but they don't behave like it. They actually block adenosine from hitting these sites. So you could accumulate adenosine in this extracellular space and these receptors don't see it. And it's why you can keep on working while drinking coffee, right? Now, but everybody says, well, what about the dependencies? Can I get hooked on chocolate Can, like I get hooked on caffeine? So what's, what causes the dependency in caffeine? Well, it's not so much, you know, the production of dopamine. You don't get a high, but what you do get is over time, your body compensates by producing more of these receptors. So to get the same buzz from coffee, you tend to drink, drink even more coffee. And worse yet, when you have a lot of these receptors and don't drink coffee, then when adenosine is present, even a little bit, you get you feel tired. So that's the kind of the type of withdrawal that you get from uh, caffeine. And it's theoretically possible to get that from chocolate too. Now I say theoretically because I really only know of one person that might consume enough chocolate to get that kind of dependency. And I'll mention that person later. But it's highly unlikely in my mind that that kind of dependency really is generated by this mechanism. There may be some other psychological reason that you have a dependency for chocolate, but I don't think it's from the me same mechanism that you get from coffee, unless you're eating an awful lot of chocolate. So that's my story on the pharmacology. Now let's talk about the, uh, these are names that'll come up in the tasting. Um, there are quite a few varieties of cacao. Uh, here's, here's the, you know, probably one amongst the three common ones. Uh, Chirolio is the, uh, thought to be the oldest, uh, but it turns out even when Europeans uh, came to the Americas, the, these have been cultivated for many years or centuries actually by that point. So the original cacao probably doesn't exist anymore. It's, they're all being cultivated. And it's an interesting um, uh, you know, genus because these are all undergrowth, what are called undergrowth plants. They, uh, they grow in rainforest-like conditions and they uh, do so with under the canopy of the large trees that are in the rainforest. And it's why ecologists like cacao as a, as a cash crop for these areas. And the reason is, is that with proper forest management, you can have a cash crop in an ecosystem that actually provides an ecosystem for many types of animals and plants. Uh, it does require management, but the fact is that this is, could, this is a fairly reasonable, when done properly, this is the kind of cash crop that is consistent with good ecosystem management. So 
the tau is actually uh, pretty good from that perspective. Uh, the differences between here, the, the, these are have different traits and we'll talk about what is very different about them from the point of view of chocolate production. But from the actual production point of view from the farmer, they differ primarily in yields. Uh, Chiroyo, while it's thought to be the oldest or similar to the oldest ones, uh, tends to have lower yields. Uh, it is thought to be less acidic, although you can control the acid as we'll talk about in chocolate a number of different ways, but it is, it is thought to be less acidic. But it's also more apparently more susceptible to disease. So the low production yield to begin with and the more susceptibility to disease means that this is a variety that um, is harder to produce and you won't see it as much. Now, you probably all know this. Uh, the the uh, cacao was first used in the Americas and first developed in the Americas. Um, and uh, what they know, knew as chocolate was is very different than what we know as chocolate. Uh, they would, uh, in the in the time when Europeans came to the Americas, what the native populations were doing with cacao was more akin to uh, manipulating the fat in the cacao. So these would be, the cacao would be whipped to try and um, froth it up and then consumed as a hot liquid with that froth. And it's the emulsion of the fat that they were consuming. Uh, this was done either with these kind of whisks that are found, archaeologists find, or uh, just done by pouring from one vessel to another to, uh, to whisk up the, the cacao. Now, I mentioned the pulp, and you may have also heard that Cacao processing involves fermentation, and it does. In fact, fermentation is a really very important part of developing the flavors in chocolate. Uh, but the truth is, it's not the bean that gets fermented, it's the pulp. Remember I said the pulp is a sweet substance, so the, there's your sugar for the fermentation process. And uh, the bean is exposed to the fermentation broth, and it's that exposure that actually develops the flavor in the bean. So I mentioned that these are highly compartmentalized. The, the, the cells that consist that are in the bean actually become lysed. So they're broken apart in the fermentation liquor. And the enzymes that the bugs in, that cause the fermentation to occur, um, they actually process those astringent materials and reduce the astringency. Um, now, the, the fermentation is done in a, usually in heaps, or in boxes. These are the two most common ways. They'll actually take the fruit, crack it open, and then usually by hand, scoop out the contents and pile it up in a heap. So this is with the pulp surrounding the bean. Now, the, it's, it's interesting because the, the fruit itself inside is sterile. And, and so it's thought, that the inoculum to get the fermentation going is actually done by hand. That is the hands touching the outside of the fruit, scooping it out, and then putting it into the heap that actually inoculates it and gets the fermentation going. So this is, you know, this is how all the chocolate is produced throughout the world. Can you imagine this? Um, the fermentation is done at the beginning anaerobically. 
So the, the, the pulp itself is gelatinous enough that it actually prevents oxygen from getting to the center of the heat. And it, um, that is a, a big part of the first part of the fermentation. So this is anaerobic fermentation for at least probably 24 to 48 hours. And what happens during this time is that that uh, pulp begins to, uh, through the fermentation process, actually begins to liquefy and actually drips out of the, uh, of the, uh, of the heap or out of, out of the bottom of the box, and then air can come in. And so the last part of the fermentation is done aerobically. Now, if, if you've, know this from either, it, uh, you, know, it, you can do anaerobic fermentation in open containers if, uh, if you manage the gas transport. So uh, if you've ever been to um, some breweries like Anchor Steam Brewery in San Francisco, the, brew, the, the beer is actually brewed in open vats and very thin open, open vats. And it's protected from air simply from the CO2 foam that is produced on top of it. And so it's a blanket of CO2 that keeps oxygen away. So you can do that. So that's how that's done. But if all the liquid comes out, air is introduced, and then you go, go on to do aerobic fermentation. And that's when you produce a lot of acid. So typically what happens is the acetic acid content goes from zero at the beginning of this process to almost one and a half percent by weight. So this is, and the same with other acids. And of course, because of the oxygen being introduced, oxidative browning. And so the color of the, the mash uh, changes. Now you, you'll, you'll, if you talk to the people that actually do this, they're monitoring it by smelling it. And one of the things they're smelling is ethanol. And they actually look for the ethanol being produced and wafting off to actually say whether the, the fermentation is going in the right direction and to when they should turn it to intro help introduce more oxygen. Or in many cases, they'll actually uh, just dig this out of one box and dump it into another. And that, of course, in introduces air in the process. Uh, it's, then you gotta stop it. And the way they stop it is to dry it. And uh, so this is critical for the process to actually, for the next stages is to make sure you have a dry product that you actually stop the fermentation, don't allow fungus to grow in the, in the product because that fungus will produce off tastes in the product. So this drying process is super important. It's one of the things that can totally destroy the crop if, if uh, they have to do it outside, they can't afford to do it with machinery. And if, if it happens to rain at the wrong time, you can lose this whole, whole crop. But the dry fermented beans now, so now we've changed, chemically changed the phen phenolic residues. Uh, all the astringent materials have been um, changed in some way. And you're left with uh, a material that consists, the most important constituents are, are something called cocoa butter, which is gonna, is called, is really fat, uh, triglycerides, uh, proteins, of course, some leftover phenolic compounds, which are actually gonna go into making the taste of the chocolate. And of course, they are bromine. So what is, cocoa butter. And the story there is around what are triglycerides. Um, in order to understand triglycerides, you have to understand fatty acids. 
So fatty acids are basically a carboxylic acid like this bonded to an aliphatic chain. And you can see there's a bunch of them mostly distinguished from one another by how long this chain is. Carbon, hy hydrogen residue. Uh, one of the things that can happen is an unsaturation in here, a double bond. And it dramatically changes the topology of this molecule when you put that in there. And of course, this is a monosaturated type residue here in that sort of thing. Uh, these are fully uh, un fully saturated molecules here. Now, what is a triglyceride? Well, actually a triglyceride is taking those, taking fatty acids and reacting it with glycerol. Glycerol is just three carbons, each bonded to a hydroxyl. And if you uh, condense the acid with the, each one of those alcohol groups, you eliminate the water and you bond the carboxylic acid to the glycerol. And you can see, I can get three of them on there, hence the name triglyceride. triglyceride. And, uh, and there can be all kinds of these, right? Because there's, I can bond a palmatic group to it or a laic group to it, a linoleic acid group to it, tons of these. And, uh, and it seems like, almost seems like a random mixture because, but nothing in biology is truly random, right? So that's, we're gonna come back to that in a second here. But the resulting molecule looks something like this. I, you know, it kind of looks like a pitchfork to me. And uh, that'll have some significance here in a second. But before I get to that, now we're gonna see some of the differences between these cacao species, these cacao of ours, right? Where you grew this, even if you take the same cacao plant and grow it in one region compared with another, it's going to have a different metabolism. It's, it's history, it's exposure, the soil that it's growing in is going to produce fat that's different from another place. So uh, these are fully saturated sources. So SSS means I get three, uh, a triglyceride with three fatty acids bonded to it, all of which are saturated. I have uh, uh, this, in this case here, this is, uh, you know, this is steric, oleic, um, steric again. You can see that these are the constituents Basically, each type of triglyceride is represented on this column, not each type, but many of them, just as an example. And now I look at what the cocoa butters produce from these different regions. You can see that they're, they're different, right? They're not the same. Uh, here, the Brazil one here in this uh, steric, uh, oleic, oleic fatty acid content is twice that of that produced in Ghana. And so the, the fat constituent, which remember, it's a pretty large fraction of, the, of what's being produced here is very different depending on the environment. And it's one of the reasons why European chocolate is not is a blend. They take cacao from all different regions of the, of the world and blend it so that they can produce a consistent product, consistent taste, uh, consistent feel in the mouth. Everything is about consistency. If you're Nestle or, you know, big, big chocolate company, Mars. And, and it's sort of, I, I I would point out to students, it's a lot like scotch. I mean, Kevin was talking about scotch. There are blended scotches and then there are single malt scotches. And the, 
Why do they produce blended scotches? Well, because they want to produce the same taste in each bottle and each batch. Uh, single malt scotches taste completely different from one, from one another. And the same thing happens with chocolate. And so uh, that's what the, when we talk about single source chocolates, what we're really mean, what we really mean is chocolate produced from a single cultivar. Okay, so then the next step, uh, once, these, once this product is, is dried, now it's stable and can be shipped. And so the traditional thing was to ship the dried product. Why? Because it's stable. And two, it's lighter because we've reduced the water content. So this would get shipped and then it goes through a process, not, not unlike what we would do for coffee, is to roast the beans. And this is another important part of the uh, flavor creation process uh, because roasting, you know, just roasting anything produces flavors that are not present in the original product. And one of the, of course, the most important parts of that flavor production during roasting is non-enzymatic browning. And, you know, if you're a chemist, you know, this is the Maillard reaction. So what that is, is that it, it's, it's the reaction of a reducing sugar. So the sugars that are present in the product, um, in the bean, uh, a reducing sugar is just any sugar that has a free aldehyde on it, you know, carbon, double bond, oxygen, uh, can react with an amine group under, with heat. And the amine groups typically here are the protein constituents, at least the end terminal uh, end of the protein constituent has, has a, an amine on it that can react. So this is not a huge reaction. Uh, you know, not a large fraction of conversion, but you don't need much to dramatically change the color and the taste of the product. I mean, your taste buds are extremely sensitive, so you don't need huge change in, changes in constituents to notice a taste. And that's, that's what happens here. So of course, the, you know, the protein has things like arginine in it, which has free amines in, uh, available in the end terminal uh, at the end terminal part of the protein. And so that can react. Uh, and this just, this just shows what the Maillard reaction is. It's just that you can think of it as a condensation between the, uh, the aldehyde group that's on the uh, reducing sugar and any amine condensation that produces water and reacts like this to produce a, what's called a glycosamine. All right, so then uh, this is really where the Europeans got involved. Um, the browning, the roasting, uh, even to some extent, some of the conching that we'll talk about uh, is produced uh, or is done in the Americas. Uh, but what happened in the 19th century was, uh, you know, it was the beginning of the Industrial Revolution. Uh, people started um, processing food uh, and enriching and doing things, things like that. And so what uh, the Dutch did initially was to extract the fat from co cocoa. And uh, basically by heating it up and pressing and squeeze out all the fat. And that produced what we now call as cocoa butter. All the brown constituents stayed behind and the cocoa butter ends up being a clear fat liquid. And that um, was used for a lot of products. Um, people were, you know, I guess, replacing whale oil or whatever they were doing with it. They were looking for new sources of fat. But what they, they also got the idea is, you know, they knew that cacao processed this way to, for making chocolate uh, would be, was 
was what the way it was because of the fat content. And uh, you know, if if you got a little bit of fat and it's good, it's probably going to be a lot better if you add more fat. And so what they did was to extract, take, you know, 50 kilos of cacao, heat it up and squeeze out the fat, and then take some of that fat and add it to the uh, to a new batch of cocoa. So you would actually produce an enriched, enriched in fat cacao. And so the the other stream, which consisted of the extracted brown constituent of the cacao, which has less fat, that became cocoa powder, the bitter uh, cocoa powder that you used to. It's not, it doesn't taste like chocolate, but it has all the astringent components to of the cacao, of the chocolate in it. So it can be used to in other dishes. And so what we know of as chocolate today is really this sort of processed or enriched, co cocoa butter enriched product. Uh, these are sort of typical dark for chocolate formulations. You'll notice uh, the, uh, the cocoa butter, added cocoa butter here is about 11, 12% in what we call dark chocolate. Bittersweet chocolate has less, and hence why it's so bitter is because it's enriched in the, the um, astringent part of the product. And then of course, milk chocolate, uh, this was another ad European adaptation. They had a lot of milk. Um, whole milk powder, dried powder, dried milk powder is actually basically cheaper than chocolate. And so people would add that to it and get a product, a totally new product. It's not like the dark chocolate you're probably tasting from Burdick's. Um, and, uh, and that's what that is. It's basically everything that would go into dark chocolate plus milk product. So that's um, the enrichment part of the process, but flavor a lot more than just the chemical constituents, it's the feel. And remember there's this brown part of what's left over of the bean that uh, is basically insoluble. And so there's, uh, you have to suspend that component in the chocolate or in the fat. And, uh, and this is done in a process called conching. Uh, these are long, very shallow bass or very shallow troughs. Uh, usually of granite. And then there's a, a cylinder that's attached to a machine that uh, rolls, a uh, granite cylinder that rolls against the granite, sort of like a mortar and pestle kind of thing, uh, that is actually milling the, the mixture to reduce the particle size and disperse those particles in the fat. So that's one thing it does. The other thing, very important thing it does, and it's the reason why this is a shallow, uh, it's not very deep. It's certainly less than eight or nine inches in depth, maybe a foot at most, that is to reduce the acid content. So this is, if you, if you walk into one of these facilities, you are inundated with, with smell and the, a lot of that smell is the volatile acid components left over from the fermentation. And they're watching this and trying to reduce the acid content to a value that will uh, be palatable. So, and they, you know, you can see in this graph here, the acid content drops to by half. Um, and uh, that's, that's an important part of it. Water is, is a big component of the, reducing the water content is also important because, you know, this is fat and water and any water in there produces an, uh, an emulsion. 
And it what that does is it it extracts sugar. So the water will extract sugar from the from the the oil phase. So the, you got to get rid of any water as you want to reduce the water content as much as possible. It also affects the the viscosity of this. So you want to reduce the viscosity. Why? Because in order to disper disperse the particles, you, you have to have the viscosity very low to be able to get the particles to disperse in the, in the fat. And this gives you an idea here. So this is the time of the conching. So this is in several different pieces of equipment. This is just one publication I, um, I looked at. And these, these pieces of equipment are different in their size and how fast they're turning and all that kind of stuff. And they basically produce different types of shear. Shear is the kind of mechanical deformation used to crush and disperse the particles. Uh, there's, but over the course of time, not only are you, you know, dispersing the particles, you're reducing the water content, the viscosity is dropping and, uh, and that's helping and you, you reduce the acid content and you can see this is going on for many hours here, right? Um, then our, all of a sudden I put these red circles on here that at some point in the process, they actually add uh, a, a very small amount of lecithin. So those of you that have uh, been around the kitchen long enough, you'll know, know lecithin. It's often added in small quantities to recipes. And you might ask, what is it? Well, it turns out it's a surfactant. And what it's doing in the case of chocolate, so in surfactant, you just need very small amounts, a tenth of a percent or less. And what it does is it's this molecule looks like this. It's um, amphipathic, right? We One side looks like fat and the other side looks like it wants to be in water. This is, this is what the nature of a surfactant. So what happens here is that this lecithin attaches itself to these particles left over from the bean and uh, this help coats it and actually helps it disperse in the fat phase because it makes the surface look more like fat. It's basically how a surfactant works. All right, so now going back to fat. Now the next slide is actually proof positive that professors have too much time on their hands. So I, one day I was coming in to class or coming into MIT on my commute and I was preparing for my chocolate lecture. And I said, you know, I always get to this point where we're talking about making the solid chocolate product. And I put up these crystal structures and, and Kevin was a great example. He fell right asleep when I put up the crystal structures of fat. And so I gotta, I gotta make it real. So uh, I decided on my way in that I was gonna make myself a fat molecule. And so here's the triglyceride sitting on my conference table in my office. And you can see it here. It's kind of got the same structures. Uh, I ran out of uh, carbon oxygen double bonds. So that's why that one's blue. But you can see here that here's one leg and here's another leg. And you'll see the reason why this is important. Now, uh, it doesn't look, it sort of looks like this, but this two, this is kind of a 2D world, flat world model of a real molecule. And if you remember you're you know, taking 511 or 3091 when you're at MIT, you'll remember these carbon-carbon bonds here, or even this uh, carbon-oxygen bond here. These are like, well, this one here is a sp3 hybrid bond. And so this, this bond can rotate, right? These bonds can rotate. Yeah, it's hindered rotation because as you rotate this, you're gonna have a methyl group go through there, but it can rotate. And so this thing is floppy. You know, I can, uh, if you, even picking up this model, you can, it can rotate around these bonds. And so when I take this molten fat in the, 
in the, uh, uh, that comes out of this conching process. And I pour it into a mold and cool it. It's this stuff in the, in the product that's gonna solidify. And so how triglycerides solidify dramatically affects the properties of the chocolate. So it's, it's not a chemical effect, it's a physical effect. So here's what I mean. So here I'm gonna look carefully, I'm gonna look down this axis, right? So I'm gonna go stand the camera over in this end. And now you can see it here. And from this end, what you see is this, these two rows, chains of carbon-carbon bonds that walk toward you in the camera here. And in fact, if I were to look at one of the crystals formed by taking this triglyceride and letting it, cooling it from the liquid and letting it crystallize, of course, what a crystal is, is a molecular crystal is just the stacking of these triglyceride molecules. Uh, it turns out they stack just like this. So here's one of these you know, pitchforks and here's another pitchfork and they pack themselves together into a crystal. Just like you know, water is a molecular or ice is a molecular crystal, right? And so the water molecules pack together when it freezes. Same thing happens with triglycerides. You get a particular crystal structure. The problem is, is that, okay, so this is, this is this, this, here's another view of this crystal structure. So here, here's just the unit cell and I can see the two crystals that form the unit cell. So this is the repeat unit. And I've looked down this axis, look, you can see the carbon carbon bonds as they walk down, see how they're parallel to one another? Just like in this picture, see how these are parallel to one another? Well, that's what happens in this crystal. They're all parallel to one another. You can see them here. Now, the problem is, remember I said this molecule is floppy. Uh, it's not the only way you can pack these molecules together. Here's another one called a beta prime structure. They're packed together like this. Well, that kind of looks the same. You know, so, Michael, you know, it, it, this kind of looks like it's packed the same way. No, look down the end. Here's one molecule. See how this one's the carbon carbon zigzag goes this way and now it goes that way. I can do that in the molecule too. See what I did? So here's, here's the zigzag this way. All I do is rotate around a carbon oxygen bond, single bond. And now the, this side goes up and down. That's all it took. That's all the difference is between these two crystal structures is how I contort this, this one, tri the triglyceride that makes up the molecule. It's a subtle, but it turns out really important difference on the properties, right? Because the solid chocolate is actually composed of crystals of these triglycerides. And depending, and these, these are what we call polymorphs. And it turns out the properties of the chocolate depend on what polymorph is present. So let me give you an idea. Let's look at, at melting point or dense and density. It turns out that these, how these molecules are contorted and how they are packed determines the density. The better packing I get, the denser the crystal is. Just as, and not too, maybe not too surprisingly, the denser the crystal is, in order to get it to come, to par come apart, I have to heat it to a higher temperature. So the melting point changes depending on which crystalline form is present. And look what I've got here. They're not, they're not, maybe not surprising given how floppy this molecule is but it turns out there are many crystalline forms, each of which has a different melting point. Now, the, and more troubling is that the melting points for these forms span room temperature 
to body temperature. So if you get a form like uh, an alpha form, this is the chocolate that'll melt in your hands, right? You, you, you pick this chocolate up and it starts melting in your hands, 24 degrees C, you're 37, right? So obviously what you want is not to melt in your hands, but to melt in your mouth. So these, you have to, the, the chocolate engineer has to produce a particular crystalline form. It's not a, it's a physical change, right? This is a physical form, the physical polymorph of the chocolate. Uh, yeah, and these are, they, they uh, it turns out some of these are not known to be produced from the melt directly. So in other words, you can't take the melt and actually cool it and produce some of these forms directly. Some of them are only from solid state phase transformation. So you're kind of limited as to what you can do. Uh, it turns out form, depending on which, you can see I got different names here. That's, it's very unfortunate. Chocolate is so important though, it has a vast literature and there's different camps of people of, that have come through and named things differently and so, the literature has crystalline forms labeled beta two or form five or all these crazy things. It's, it's, it's rather inconvenient from a scientific point of view. But the, the point is, is that careful, careful analysis will show that these things are, for instance, form five and beta two are the same thing. Uh, not only is the melting point important, is changed by these forms, but things like the mechanical properties mechanical hardness, snap. Uh, we'll talk about that when we get to the tasting is that snap, uh, good chocolate will actually, when you break it, it actually snaps. It's near brittle. There's no plasticity when you, when you go to break it. So a plastic uh, deformation would be as you, start, as you start to put stress on it, it actually deforms. Not, good, not a good sign in chocolate. If it does that, usually it's usually what you see in milk chocolate. Yeah, I mean, milk chocolate will definitely plastically deform before it breaks. Fine chocolates do this by uh, having mechanical properties that are make it brittle. Uh, that's just another form. Oh, I sorry, I didn't got those out of order. Okay, so how do you produce a specific crystalline form? And uh, so there are basically two ways in the industry. Uh, the challenge is, is yes, while some of these forms, let's say the high melting forms are technically thermodynamically the most stable, they're actually kinetically the most difficult to produce because it, the whole world is not just driven by thermodynamics. You have these kinetic constraints. And so in the very least is there's an activation barrier. It's a reaction, right? Crystallization is reaction. There's an activation barrier. It not, the barrier depends on what you're producing. So let's say the beta phase here is the most stable. Thermodynamically, that's the one that should form. But if there's a higher barrier, you may first produce the alpha, right? Lower barrier. That's, this is what, gets you into the realm of what's called time temperature transformation. So what, can, what happens is, is that you take the molten cacao, mostly molten, molten fat, and you cool it below the melting point, nothing happens. It just sits there. No crystal, you're below the melting point, no crystals. You have to wait. You have to wait for the nucleation event to occur. And uh, the farther you get below the melting point, the faster it will occur. The downside of going too far below the melting point of the form that you want is that you also become below the melting point of the forms you don't want. And there's likelihood that they will be nucleated before the form you want. So if, if you were to just blindly do this, you would say, okay, just barely go below the melting point and wait for a long time because you don't want any of these forms to produce, be produced. And theoretically, that's what would happen. So in other words, if I went to 30 degrees C 
and didn't let it go, go any cooler and waited long enough, I could wait and get 50% of the mass to be, or 50% of the liquid to convert to form five, the one I want. The problem with that is that it takes too long. So what are the other ways to do it? Well, industrially, this is what they do. They, it's called tempering. And uh, so what they do is they uh, heat to high temperatures so it's fully molten, well above the melting point of all forms. And then they cool below the melting point of the form they want. So in this illustration, I've got form five and form four. So I cool below the melting point of both of these. So what happens is I'm producing the nuclei of two forms, form four and form five, the one I want. If I just stayed there, I wouldn't produce pure form five. I'd have crystals of form four, maybe a few crystals of form five. The trick is, is that now that I have nuclei, what they do is they heat back up. And they now I've produced a nuclei, I've done it very quickly, and I heat it up to above the melting point of form four, but below the melting point of form five. This is called the growth soak. This is where they grow the crystals of the form they want. So typically in the freezing process, so where they put the molten cacao product, at this point now it's chocolate because it's usually enriched in fat, in the mold, it cycles through a temperature, temperature, complicated temperature profile like this, because they're forcing it. They get all kinds, they go to a low enough temperature, they get all kinds of nuclei. They don't let it completely freeze. They heat it up above the melting point of any form four nuclei that were there melt away and you're only left with nuclei of form five. This was, this is how it's done industrially. Chocolatiers practice something very different. They practice what's called seeding. They take a batch of solid chocolate that um, worked well and they shave it into small pieces. They take their new batch of molten chocolate and before they allow any nucleation, they add the old solid batch to it. What are they doing? they're putting seeds of the new crystals, the crystals they want in there. And that's how they do it. So you probably, you'll probably see this in cookbooks. You know, people will talk about taking the old batch and adding it to it. Purely, it's not a chemical thing. It's not, obviously not a biologic thing. It's, it sort of sound, looks biological, right? Cause it's like, it's like making yogurt or something from an old batch or something. Uh, it, but it's not, it's purely physical. Um, yeah, so how, this all gets back to the cultivars, right? So the various sources of chocolate have different types of triglycerides. So you can see it's a very complicated landscape uh, with a natural product. So each cultivar has its optimum thermal processing window right so it's it's it, it's it's an art to make chocolate and this it's this is why uh, the other thing that you probably run run into is bloom i'm almost done here so we'll we'll get to that uh this is this is a solid phase, state phase transformation and it's common in inexpensive chocolates that has been improperly tempered so what's happened here is that it has an unstable polymorphic form in the solid. And so it can actually in the package undergo a solid state phase transformation to the more stable crystalline form. And that's what that ugly stuff is on stale chocolate. Now, why is it stale? Well, it's not, nothing biologic has happened to it, but these large crystals have grown on the surface and large crystals make it taste gritty. And that's what that gritty stale chocolate taste comes from is a solid state phase transformation. Uh, 
fair trade, um, you know, uh, I talked a little bit about the history of chocolate. I used to talk, do more of that. Um, but I, I, need to, I need to say that, you know, it turns out truthfully, the history of chocolate is kind of a history of exploitation. You know, these, uh, the cocoa producing parts of the world are, are equatorial regions around the world. And they, uh, uh, you know, it's uh, the value add, at least the Europeans uh, sort of manipulated the market, make, manipulate the market so that they are adding, quote, the largest value by these downstream processing and that, uh, you know, conching and roasting and um, enriching and things like that. But so much of the chocolate taste is dictated right there in the cultivar, the, the, uh, the region in which it was grown. And uh, so in the past few decades, there's been a real interest in, in sort of getting to these single source chocolates, single cultivar type chocolates. And, uh, you know, Grenada is an example of that. There's many of the, these now. Um, and it's in part, it's, it's actually getting the value add to the farmers that are actually producing this. So it's truly really, really a fair trade part of it. And the cool thing is, is that people now can appreciate the differences between chocolates. Uh, it, chocolate is not a homo homogeneous product. And, uh, so people are trying to, you know, celebrate the differences now. And that's what that, that's about. These are, there are many small companies like this. I also want to end with, you know, sort of the future. Um, cacao is uh, interesting. I, you know, I mentioned that from the point of view of sustainability, cacao has a lot of uh, good things about it. Uh, it, uh, it. It it can grow underneath a canopy, so you can sustain a rainforest type ecosystem and produce a cash crop. That's a very interesting attribute. There are very few agricultural value add type products that allow you to do that. And so that's a very interesting part of the, uh, the chocolate business and maybe needs to be thought of more in the, in the future about how to do that. Uh, but there is some concern about climate change. And it's interesting because you might think that the hotter the planet got, planet got the, that might be beneficial to, to plants like te Teobroma cacao. And uh, there's some truth to that. However, the problem with that is that a lot of the models that look out in places like uh, West Africa, which is the largest producer of uh, cacao in the world, um, is that the, the expectation is not only does it get hotter in this climate, but it also gets drier. And that is the Achilles heel of Teobroma cacao. It's a rainforest crop. And there's a, such a concern now, you can find, you know, think companies like Mars are actually investing in genetic engineering the cacao plant to be drought resistant because they know this is coming. So uh, I don't know if you're in the futures market, but uh, you know this is this could be a, a challenge for cacao in the coming coming years. And I mentioned I, I promised there would be an exception that I know of that quite possibly is addicted to chocolate. And the only person I know that consumes enough chocolate is my good friend Bob Langer. Uh, Bob is uh, you know one of one of my as I mentioned a good friend. He's also uh, uh, you know somebody that everybody looks to as a, a mentor at, at MIT, but he is known uh, amongst his friends as being a chocoholic to extreme. So, so much so that they actually named in the, if you go to the Coke uh, cafeteria, Coke uh, building, um, they actually have in the, in the, the cookie shelf, a, a cookie named after Bob, just to give you an idea. So if, if people want to do an experiments on, you know, really studying whether there's a uh, possible addiction biochemistry associated with chocolate, they might ask Bob 
to consent to the trial. All right, so the last bit, I don't really know how to do a tasting on, on, uh, on Zoom or on YouTube, but uh, Kevin, you know, I had recommended the, this, uh, that people look into the single source chocolates and LA Burdick uh, has sold for a long time uh, these single source uh, ones. And I thought since it's in Cambridge and that people might, uh, and in Boston, you, you might be able to get access to these things. And um, uh, it's a great selection that they have. Uh, it's, it, it's changed a bit over the years uh, as, as they get new uh, single sources involved. Um, it's uh, heavily focused on the Americas, um, but we've had other like Indonesian ones and things like that. So this is the one, the current mix that, that's there. Um, my family has, uh, has gotten these boxes for a number of years and uh, we have a practice at, at dinner, after dinner. Uh, in fact, the first year was the funniest. We, we actually took notes, tasting notes. So my two kids and my wife and I would, after each uh, dinner, my wife would select the chocolate blinded and give it to us. And we would put our tasting notes down. And then days later, um, we would have to see, is this the same as we had the day before or two days before or something like that? So it's kind of a fun thing to do with your family. And, uh, and, uh, and, and it kind of spreads out the joy over a, a longer period of time rather than just binging on, on uh, seven bars of chocolate all at once, although that would be kind of cool. Um, this, the, the tasting notes here sort of touch on the, um, the things that are, I think are important. Um, the, uh, there, this, this list is actually focused on what I would say the chemical aspects of this, you know, but I do think there's a whole list of physical aspects that are very important uh, in tasting of chocolate. First off is that mechanical properties, uh, the touch, what happens when you touch it with your finger? If it starts to melt, that's something to note. I mean, if it, if it melts in your hand and, and uh, before it gets to your mouth, that's a sign that, you, that it can affect the taste. The, the next thing is the texture in the mouth. It, the, you'll notice, and particularly in some uh, single source chocolates, like I, I had one from um, Trader Joe's that um, was really, um, not that it tasted bad, but it was very unique in the sense that there was, it had not been crunched very much at all. So there, were, there was, it was larger amounts of the bean left in the chocolate. And that's a kind of different style, but it, it's a physical attribute that does affect the taste. Um, the creaminess, and, and the other thing is the, the taste that you get at the beginning, I think it's more so that even more than wine is that the taste you get at the beginning and the taste you get at the end are very different with chocolates. And it's because as it melts, it's sort of, uh, you're removing the flavor constituents at different rates. And uh, so you get a dramatically different effect at the beginning and the end, this kind of the aftertaste of it. People talk about it with, with wine, and I suppose I, I notice that with wine also, but I, I notice it way more with chocolate. And uh, so that's a big part of the tasting experience also. But then uh, the other thing that you'll notice in this list, and each one of these uh, that you'll have, in, if you did get these, uh, has in the collection, is that what type of, of uh, a bean was it from? Which, which one of these varieties was it from? So Nacional, uh, also called Ariba, is, is one that I didn't mention before, but is a very common one. Uh, and it's thought to be, it's highly, very highly regarded. Uh, why it's regarded that way, I don't know. It's very, it is strong. It's said to be strong, but it's also said to be less acidic. 
I never really understood that too, though, too much though, because you can manipulate, as I mentioned, you manipulate the acidity uh, many different ways other than what's in the bean. So uh, I'm not really sure I buy into the acidity attribute being associated with the particular bean, uh, but it is, it is uh, something to know, do you taste acid? Uh, I will just pick out one here. This one is from Brazil, which I notice has been heavily consumed by my comrades here at the home. And, um, but I think it's a good example. Um, I've got it here, even with the elevated temperature that we are now experiencing, it's not melting in my hand. Oops. And I'll try and snap it here. Did you hear that? Yeah, that's that's a pretty good snap. It's not as snappy as other ones I've done, but it is um, it is pretty good. And you want that you want that surface to be shiny black, shiny brown too. That's good. That's a good sign that it's you know, this one's not as shiny as I would normally see it. Now, of course, this package has been open for a while. Very smooth. Almost tangy. Melts really well. And a smooth. The other thing I've noticed is some of these, the the if there's any grit involved at all, it stays there longer. And in the you, you actually notice it in the aftertaste. So I think that's pretty cool. So we thought about, I don't know, Kevin, do you have any recommendations on how, since you've done tastings this way before, what have people done? And, or we can just go to questions. Yeah, usually we um, taste through kind of a prepared list. You have one here. Uh, I don't think we need to taste through all seven, but you know maybe um, you can try one other and kind of com contrast what you're experiencing from a different region to the Brazil one. I'd also, um, out of my own curiosity, I'd like to know of the seven here, do you have any favorite or favorites and why? I can tell you we like the Venezuelan one the most because it's act totally gone from this package. <laughs> um, why I don't, you know, the, it is, uh, you know, it's interesting because, you know, the lore I mentioned earlier, Cirolo, uh, is supposed to be the most uh, prized. And um, it's actually debatable whether it actually is better than the others, uh, but it is the hardest to produce. So maybe that's what the origin of the, of the, uh, you know, the scarcity is what makes it better, I guess. Uh, but it is interesting that it is, uh, the Venezuelan one is, maybe I should try the Madagascar one. That's what I'm on right which, now. <laughs> which is also rich in that. But basically, but basically we like to, so this one has not been opened yet. And it's interesting because it is, um, very shiny. Uh, my guess is it'll be a much better snap. Yep. Do the tasting notes that they have here ring true to your palate? Yeah, it's definitely more acidic. But like I said, I'm not sure that's attributed to the uh, to the bean. Right. I think it's maybe just how it was processed, but it's definitely more acidic. I guess that I guess they call it citrus 
I'm not sure I taste citrus, but I do taste more acid, but I guess maybe it's the same thing. Um, yeah, so I like that one. <laughs> what else can I tell you? <laughs> That's a perfect tasting note. I like it. <laughs> yeah, I'm not. Definitely the aftertaste is different. Than, than the, than the uh, Brazilian one. Just looking through the, the list uh, of the notes, I'm trying to find something that would contrast with that. My eye is drawn to the Peru. It's one of the highest cocoa content bars, and it's also um, stated as being more robust and kind of darker flavors. Do you have that one on hand as well? I'm sure I do. Oh, I don't. Oh, no, here it is. In between. It is, um, I don't think it's as shiny as what I just saw. When you go between samples, do you use anything to cleanse your palate? I just have water myself. Just time. So I won't, I'll wait until I, It, it actually, the aftertaste shouldn't stay long. It's not like a wine. Um, let me see. Yeah, this one's, it's right. The aftertaste is coffee. Yeah, that is, they got, they nailed it on this one. It, it's, um, you know, I, I wouldn't notice that. I didn't notice it when I first bit into it, but the, you know, as the fat drains away, melts away, you're left with what tasted like a coffee bean in my mouth. All right. That's that's really interesting. I don't I don't know. You know, the coffee plants are not related. They're from even though it's processed it's, you know roasted in the same way, they're not it's not a um, not related to um, cacao. And in fact, they were first, they were in North Africa or Middle East or something like that was the origin of coffee. I think that's common across a lot of uh, fine foods and beverages. You get flavors that are reminiscent of many other things and they're completely unrelated. Um, I'm trying the Ecuador bar and it, uh, the, the kind of the spiciness of it uh, resonates with me for sure. Definitely robust. Yeah, I, you know, I the most unusual in this batch is probably that Peru one. Hmm. I don't know why it's just very much stronger. And uh, I think the uh, the raisins thing here is a good uh, a good. Um, Description also. Well, um, maybe everyone's brain has gotten a little bit of a, a breather and uh, we're ready to ask some questions. Are you okay if we move on to questions? Absolutely. Great. We had a lot roll in. Um, so I'll just uh, start from the top. It's kind of a mix of some science questions as well as some consumer questions. And um, the first one we have is, um, when you decide what kind of chocolate to use in cooking or baking, what properties of the chocolate would you recommend that we know about and consider? 
Yeah, so that's a really good question. Um, the fat content is less significant than most of these. So, so for example, um, my wife makes these excellent chocolate souffles and they use sort of bake, baking chocolate which has, which has reduced fat content, mostly because you're adding the chocolate flavor to something else that has the fat in it. Um, so baker's chocolate, uh, although some people don't mind eating baker's chocolate, it's very bitter and stuff like that. It's a different kind of product, it has reduced fat content or and reduced sugar content, right? So sugar is an important constituent that they fortify uh, European style chocolate with. And um, which I forgot to mention, but uh, it's another fortification, not just the fat. And um, so uh, th that's a very common way to use chocolate in cooking is, you know, just that bitter astringent taste, the chocolate taste concentrated and added to other uh, sources of fat and, um, and sugar. Um, so that's the primary way to do it. Um, the other ways are uh, uh, also the bitter constituents are used as, as a true spice um, in a lot of Mexican cooking and things like that. They, they actually use uh, the you know, unfortified uh, chocolate as a spice. So yeah, I don't know if that really answered the question or not, but that's, that's how it's generally used in cooking as opposed to taking bar chocolate and using it. Sure. Um, a consumer related question for you. What is the best bar of chocolate you've ever had and where did you buy it and where did the beans come from? Boy, that's a loaded question. Hmm. Oh, I have to say, I probably had the greatest number of tastings from places like Burdick's, but I've actually gotten good good ones at Trader Joe's. You know, I think uh, you'll find, you know, th that kind of place has a large turnover of products and things like that. They're not the same every time they buy a lot of something and and so it's hard to go back and get the same thing, but I think it's well worth it. I don't, I don't know that I've ever had a, an absolute favorite one. Like right tonight, tonight I think the Peru, Peru one is pretty good. That's my favorite. <laughs> yeah. When I think about chocolates that stand out based on texture, um, you know, you talked a lot about how to make it kind of a refined texture. I think of the Taza line of yeah. very gritty chocolates. What is your take on that texture? Does it I think it's, yeah, it's, it's then the feel is part of the experience, right? Mm -hmm. So it's a different type of product. I wouldn't call it, it's, I mean, I don't know. I guess someone would say it's less refined, but uh, you know, it's fine. I like that. Okay. Um, another question is, why are, does it seem that chocolate cultivars are of less consideration in the chocolate market than wine cultivars or grape varieties are in, in wine or you know, the type of coffee bean and coffee? Is it something in the processing that makes them matter less or is it just kind of a perception issue? Well, I think the, the cultivars in wine are you know, a result of marketing. Um, you know, the, there's a great uh, book on on champagne, um, and uh, you know, it used to be champagne was just spoiled wine, and it was only through the genius of marketing that uh, and got it to be the select wine of the Russian court, which then created the the aura around champagne and uh so it's i think i think it's just marketing you know the uh 
uh, I think over the past 20 years, this idea of single source chocolates has really developed. So it's only been 20 years. And uh, prior to that, you never heard about that. You, were, you couldn't get any of that. And it was, uh, it was sort of controlled by Mars and Nestle and, you know, these big conglomerates. The only chocolate you got was blended chocolates, so, which sort of blended away the uniqueness of all these different cultivars. And um, so I think uh, the, uh, the experience going forward is, you know, with the right marketing uh, and, you know, places like Burdick are doing their job to, you know, help these uh, smaller um, producers um, market their product. And, and uh, if you go to, you can go to the web and or YouTube or wherever you you go and you will find these folks, you know, trying to differentiate their, their, uh, their locally grown, locally produced uh, product, chocolate product. I think it's, I think it's just the marketing aspect because there's clear differences. I mean, you, if you taste, if you get work your way through, I wouldn't suggest doing it all at once, but over the course of time, work your way through, uh, you know, a box of these and you can clearly tell the difference between these different products. Um, and, uh, you know, it's probably not as dramatic, but it could be as dramatic as, as scotches, single malt scotches. I was mentioning to Kevin, I did a, I went to a conference in Scotland quite a number of years ago and they had a scotch tasting there. And uh, yeah, of course I had single malt scotches before, but th this, the guy that put this on was spectacular because he had chosen a dozen of these things to span the range of what's produced in Scotland as single malts. And you would not believe that they were even close to the being the same product. They tasted so different. Mm -hmm. And in scotch, as you probably know, a lot of that taste is in the processing. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's all the processing, you know, what barrels do you use and all of that kind of stuff. And it's, it's not, you know, it's not in the, necessarily in the mash, <laughs> you know, the taste is developed through the processing. Mm -hmm. uh, in chocolate, it's like that too. Um, you know, it's, but it's, but it's both, right? It's in the plant. The plant produces a different, you know, one field produces a different mixture of triglycerides. The same is true with the uh, phenolic components to the bean. And, uh, it's very different from another field. But at the same time, you can do things in the processing that affect the, the, what, what happens to those taste constituents, like the fermentation itself. You know, it's interesting that chocolate was probably, archaeologists actually think that chocolate was, as, as the Europeans discovered when they came to Central America, that that, that was chocolate that that they were consuming at that point was actually a derivative of what they originally had been cultivating the cacao plant for. And as I mentioned earlier, it was it's thought to actually have been the pulp. Uh, the pulp was is easily fermented. And so it was a source of fermented uh, drinks, you know, uh, alcoholic drinks, which weren't necessarily, I mean, it's just sort of like in Europe too. Why did they produce beers? Well, it's because water was always contaminated. So the alcohol killed all the bugs. And th that's why a lot of these peoples throughout the world depended on fermentation was because, so that they'd have a drinking supply. And yeah, of course they abused alcohol too, but, but it really was a necessity and so that's one of the things that they were, they were doing originally. So if you look at uh, archeological finds, they find the residue of the pulp in a lot of these containers. And so the, the thinking is, is that the original use for this plant was actually in fermenting the pulp at fermenting the fruit, like we do with many fruits. And it was only then that they started to say, what can we do with the rest of the plant? And that turned into extracting the fat and using that as cacao. 
Yeah, there's an amazing number of parallels to the world of uh, beer. Oh, it is. Absolutely. I mean, it's, you know, fermentation has been around for, you know, tens of thousands of years. Mm -hmm. And, uh, and it's an important part of, of food production has been for, for, for survival, right? It's, it's done for preserving, uh, produces, a, you know, the alcohol is actually helps preserve the, the product. So there's lots of, lots of reasons to have been experimenting with, with fermentation. On the topic of uh, alcoholic beverages and wine, do you ever pair any drinks? Oh, wine is super good with chocolate. In fact, um, well, many people will actually put chocolate into wine. Hmm. Um, and it's, a, but, even tastings with wine are very common, um, mostly with red wines. But I, I imagine there are people that do the same thing with with uh, white wines. All in the name, uh, you know, like a dry, a dry white wine, um, like a Sancerre or something like that, might be really good with some chocolates. You know, if you're talking about cleansing your palate, what better way to do that to, to chase chocolate with? Uh, with a dry white wine, that would definitely cleanse the palate. I'll give that a try. <laughs> <laughs> I know, but regrets, um, red wine, though, it, I don't think it would do, have quite the same effect because both have such a long aftertaste. You know that that um, I think you need to. The idea would be to combine the two um, because I I think you you just get along tail on the end of a, a sip of red wine. And so I think having the chocolate chase that is really to enhance the, the follow on flavor. You mentioned single malt scotch. One of my most vivid experiences with chocolate was actually as a pairing with a heavily sherried single malt scotch, the Dalmore at a tasting in Boston. That was where I really got turned on to the idea that scotch and chocolate could go together so uh, oh so yeah I imagine that would <laughs> that would be yeah I have to think about that so I would not you know I, I don't pd end of of it would work well hmm. at least not for me I, I would I'm not a big fan of the pd um scotches uh like what is it Isle of Sky ones like super pd it just tastes like too much, too much like solvent to me. Um, uh, but the, but like you say, the, the milder ones, um, you know, the more barrel tasted type uh, single malts, mm -hmm. I think would be good too. Great. Um, let's see, we've got, a few more here. Um, I think you touched on this a, a bit when you were talking about um, the conching process, but chemically, what happens when one gets water in melted chocolate? Right, you make it, um, uh, it, it it's, it's, you know, just like oil and water, it doesn't mix. So you make it, at most you make an emulsion. And uh, so if you add water to molten chocolate, and stir it up, you'll get droplets, or it can go either way, but most likely you get droplets of water in the fat. And the bad part of that is that some of the constituents in the chocolate will dissolve in the water. We call it partition into the water. And uh, you, don't, you don't want that. You're extracting things that you didn't want to do. It also affects the viscosity. So you can dramatically, once you get an emulsion, it, well, it can go either way, but most of the time it increases the viscosity of the, of the chocolate and, and it makes just a mess. So you try to avoid, try it. Well, I guess it's conceivable that, you know, you want to, you know, create a texture in something. So if you, if you solidified that, I'm, it may produce a, you know, a texture that might be interesting, but Generally speaking, it's not something that you want to do. You want to extract water from chocolate. Very good. Um, 
let's see, this is a little bit of a long windup. Um, I found it difficult to identify a dark chocolate bar that meets California's Prop 65 levels for lead. I know many chocolate bars are also too high in cadmium. Can you speak to heavy metal contamination in chocolate or recommend any low contaminant brands? Um, so where do the heavy metals come from? Well, I can tell you agriculturally uh, that where these come from typically is the irrigation. And uh, so there are parts of the world where that where uh, irrigation um, runoff. So, so if if you if you're irrigating agricultural land, you apply water. It obviously goes through into the earth, uh, and then it, unless you're draining it at the same time, it will build up. And so, uh, you know, the, the famous one is in California, uh, the, uh, you know, the near Bakersfield, they're irrigating, they take the saline water that is building up. If they didn't take it away, it would turn half of the San Joaquin Valley into a desert within a few decades. So they, uh, they collect, the drainage water, as they call it, in drainage ditches. And for many years, they just sent it north in canals. And they sent it north, they said, well, there was a natural, uh, sorry, this is kind of a long story, but they, there's a, there was a natural salt marsh in Kestrina. And it was naturally salty and and so migratory birds would go there and stuff like that. And they said, well, let's just dump the saline water exactly there. And what they didn't realize is that uh, the water going through the soil near Bakersfield extracted, uh, I think in that case, it was arsenic. And so the, the, the drainage water Enriched in arsenic, and they dumped it all in Kesterson, and it made it one of the first uh, big uh, EPA uh, sites to to clean up. So uh, this happens in it could be naturally occurring. So you know if you if it's if it's uh, you know a natural deposit where the plants are. But more often than not, it's from poor irrigation management and uh, in highly cultivated areas. Uh, because what the people don't realize as they're moving water, they're also extracting metals. So that is a probably the largest single source um, uh, of the problem. Now, in, w w I'm not really familiar with it being super big problem in specifically cacao, uh, but it's possible that you would run into, you know, particular producers that were not monitoring this in their, in their product. So it is, I think it is something that to be concerned with because it is there are agricultural products where metals are enriched in the, uh, the practices that are being used in agriculture. Good to know. Um, the next one is how does the environment have such a high impact on fatty acid makeup? If the molecular machinery is the same and the carbon, hydrogen, oxygen, of the fatty acids are available essentially anywhere, what confers this difference? Yeah, well, this is, so um, not everything is, you know, much of what happens in a cell is determined by the environment because there's, you know, there's obviously, obviously genetic, a genetic information in each cell, but post-translation, much processing happens to, before it produces a particular protein. 
And that, um, all that post-processing is environmentally dictated. Uh, and uh, so, you know, it's sort of nature or nurture, right? It's, uh, it's the way these plants and just like all living things operate is in part the genetic information that's present, which as, as a questioner points out is, well, how can it really be different from one to another? But, but it's, that's only half the story or even some say less than half the story because after you've translated the genetic information into let's say the first part of the RNA process, there's all kinds of post-processing that happens to change the RNA, change the change protein once it's been produced. There's, you can actually have modifications of the protein that are environmentally dictated. So actually quite a bit is dictated by the environment. Very good, thank you. Next is another consumer question. Um, you mentioned Trader Joe's chocolates. Um, what would you say is the best chocolate value uh, for kind of the less expensive chocolates? I'm thinking things that might be available at uh, a grocery store, for example. Yeah, I think, um, yeah, I've had good, good luck at Trader Joe's. Um, as far as chocolate goes, in fact, some of the, one of the years uh, we did the, uh, uh, you know, chocolate lecture at MIT, we, um, we did not only Burdick's, but we got, we went to Trader Joe's and got a selection of theirs. And I, as far as I could tell, they were just as, even though they tasted different, but that was the whole point. We wanted to show people that, they tasted different, you know? So I think that they're pretty good, generally are pretty good value. Now, the, the issue is you can't go back and get the same thing the next time, right? right? Which is good, right? They're, I guess their buyers go all over the place and, you know, they buy out the entire crop, ship it to Trader Joe's all over. Mm -hmm. and, and, you know, since it's a small producer, that's it. And then of course the next year, it's different. Get it while you can, <laughs> I guess. Yeah, get it while you can. I mean, that, I think that's that's fine. It's like there's a lot of wines that are the same way. You're only going to get them. Mm -hmm. There are small producers. You're, you know, they, have, they they produce 200 cases and then that's it. Yep. Um, actually, that's a, a something I hadn't thought about too. Is there a, an analog to the idea of a vintage in wine, uh, kind of a vintage in chocolate? Have you ever seen vintage chocolates or anything like that? Hmm. I have not seen that. You know, they probably don't. Is there a shelf life? I believe that there is a shelf life for chocolate uh, because it potentially can be oxidized. Uh, so packaging is important. Uh, if it's if it's tempered correctly, you're not going to get bloom. Uh, so, you know, in fact, you know, I've had this. This particular package has been around for a number of months uh, at my house here. And there's no evidence. We actually, Tina, my, my wife got it out after dinner tonight and said, look, oh, we should look to see if they're, these are okay. And we open up, she opened up a few and she goes, yeah, they look great. So uh, there's a shelf life, um, but uh, you know, I don't know that the taste develops over time, like a wine would, it's still changing in the bottle kind of thing. Uh, I don't think that that's the case with chocolate. Um, but does it vary from year to year? My guess is it does. Um, and, you know, because the temperature is different, all that kind of stuff, you're going to get different constituents in the bean. Um, so, it's from that standpoint, I would, I would think that there are vintages in the sense that you can go to the same hillside this year and taste, taste it 
and then the next year you're going to get a different product. And even just to the point of, it's not so much the events, but right. Remember, I said uh, the inoculation. While there, industrially, there are people experimenting with inoculating the f fermentation with fashion with the right mix of bugs and all that stuff, bacteria and yeast. Uh, it's not generally practiced that way. So it's the natural, you know, uh, bacteria and and uh, fungus that's in the forest that is going to be used as the inoculum. And uh, so that doesn't necessarily say it must stay the same year to year. Because of the weather conditions, you know, maybe it's drought, uh, all kinds of all kinds of things can change that. Yeah, absolutely. That's great. And it's why it's such a manual process. I mean, I I remember I saw a YouTube interview with uh, one of these uh, folks that you know, a farmer, um, and how he um, controlled the fermentation process. And it was largely by smell. Um, he kept, he mentioned, of course it was translated, but he mentioned he was uh, really smelling the alcohol as to when to start to turn the, the heap. Uh, because the anaerobic portion of the fermentation is producing primarily alcohol. And it's then when you go to the aerobic fermentation that you're producing the acid, right? It's like going from making wine to making vinegar kind of thing. And, um, and so once he got a strong enough smell of alcohol, he knew that it was now time to turn the, the heap. And so that's, uh, that's an indication of he's trying to go from, he may not have realized it, but, but, but that's clearly the message that I'm going to go from anaerobic to aerobic fermentation. And then the, everything changes in a matter of a few hours, the uh, bugs that are growing change the population, change their population, right? Because they're dividing so quickly. And then of course, it, then uh, the second phase, it really starts to heat up, right? Because now you have a aerobic uh, fermentation. And so it's starting to, it's sort of like now becomes much more like a compost heap, right? You really got oxygen in there and it's really taking off. And so the population of bacteria, well now at that point, it's probably all bacteria. There's no fungus left. Uh, growing because it's just too hot, killing all that stuff away. Mm -hmm. uh, I did want to note that we're at the stated end time of the event, uh, nine o'clock Eastern, but yep. Professor Sima has uh, graciously uh, agreed to stay a little longer. And if you're still okay with that. I'm um, fine. People want to. We have a, a, quite a list. So I'd like to try and knock off a few more. Sure. Uh, you're okay staying still. Great. Um, is there anything that you're personally still trying to learn about chocolate? That I'm still trying to learn about chocolate? Mm -hmm. ah, that's a good question. Hmm. Yeah, I think uh, I, I, I think this part about what's really different between these and, and uh, I've grown more and more fascinated with uh, sort of the, the fermentation part of the, the process. Uh, it's sort of critical for um, really changing the, it's probably the, of all the steps in production of chocolate, it's probably the single largest change in taste of the product happens at that point, right? Because prior to that point, this thing is like 
this material is so unbelievably bitter, you couldn't possibly eat it. Hmm. And uh, after that point, it becomes closer, much closer to what we know of as chocolate. So a lot of it is happening right there. And, um, uh, you know, I'd like, you know, you might looking at it and say this is a very uncontrolled process, but clearly, you know, people who practice this know what they're doing. They've done it many times and they know what makes a good batch and what makes, doesn't make a, what makes a bad batch. Right. Uh, so I kind of think it's cool. I mean, it's kind of a cool thing to do. I like this. The other thing I like about this idea as I've, uh, and I mentioned tonight, um, is the idea that this is a, this is an important, a different type of agricultural product in the sense that this is a product that could be a cash crop for people that need cash crops that actually, uh, when practiced correctly, enhances the ecosystem. So in other words, you can, this, this is a cash crop that thrives because of the existence of a rainforest. You know, that's a really interesting concept. You know, um, are there other crops that we can, can uh, conceive of to do the same thing so that you don't have to, that people don't have to, to make a living, don't have to uh, clear forests. Right. Kind of an interesting, unique thing of, of cacao. Um, you know, it, it just, uh, to me that I find that fascinating, you know, and it, it maybe one of the things, you know, we were talking about curiosity earlier. Uh, you know, wh what do curious people do? Well, they're looking, they're, they're discovering solutions to things, to problems they haven't encountered yet. And, you know, that's kind of what I feel, uh, you know, that part, you know, at least for me lately about cacao is, is, is that, that's a really interesting thing. It may not be that the answer, you know, we can't, the world maybe can't, Maybe it should, uh, can't survive on chocolate alone. But the concept that, gosh, you know, are there other things that, that you could do in an, to enhance an ecosystem that you could still make an environment where many different types of plants and animals uh, can thrive, yet still have a productive crop? Hmm. Kind of an interesting idea. You mentioned fermentation as an area that you're especially interested in. And one of the top questions right now is, uh, do you know of any sophisticated um, approaches or are, is there any sophistication? What is the level of sophistication to fermentation, such as in winemaking, there are things like designer yeasts. Uh, I know in, in scotch. Right. Well, there's certainly, way. you know, the big industrial people are very concerned about reproducibility. Mm -hmm. And so you will find papers uh, uh, on trying to inoculate with very controlled cultures, right? Multiple species of cultures, bacteria and yeast to do it. I don't think it's practiced anywhere. It was just primarily experimentation. And then the big thing that people are investing in is is uh, drought resistant cacao. And um, not because I think it's an issue now, but I think the big industrial players have, uh, you know, put their chart on the wall and realized that uh, climate change is happening. And, uh, you know, for whatever reason, but their business is gonna depend uh, out, you know, so many decades on having a, a source of cacao that is resistant to drought. And that's all driven by climate change. Do you know any other areas of research that are going on uh, in the world of chocolate? Yeah, I think, 
I think those are the big ones. Um, uh, you know, uh, I think there's a renewed interest in forestry management, um, largely driven by concerns of climate change and ecosystem change because it's not just climate change that we're worried about and loss of rainforest, but ecosystems for many different types of, of plants and animals. And um, so I think that's part of this, this whole concept of the productive forest um, is uh, a new research area. And um, yeah. I think on the on the chocolate side, I think there's been it's really a quite elaborate history of research into chocolate. You know, all these polymorphic forms that I've described. That's probably been since the '80s, '70s, and '80s. There was a lot of that of the I would call the physical chemistry of chocolate, and um, the. Uh, uh, I think the biology of that Teobroma cacao and genetics has been, um, you know, it was only sequenced in the late 90s, maybe early 2000s. So there's still a lot of new biology to discover there. Hmm. Um, undoubtedly, that's playing a big role in trying to make uh, drought resistant um plants sure. and uh so yeah there's there's still research going on i mean it's an important crop um west africa it's a huge crop huge part of their uh, economy and in central america of course and in Indi indonesia mm -hmm. and i know mit used to have a food science program i think course 20 before it became BE was food science. Um, yeah. You're probably familiar with that. Do you know if there's still any kind of food uh, science going on at MIT in that way? Or is there anything around chocolate or the sustainability of chocolate happening at MIT? I don't, I don't know of any. Uh, it's, it's, I would be, I'm, I would be surprised that there's none just because it's, you know, a lot of this, so many things at MIT are driven by student interests, not faculty interests. And, uh, you know, you start talking about chocolate, students get interested. I mean, here it was all these years later, you were, the, the thing you remember from the kinetics class was the chocolate lecture. Possibly the only thing I remember from all of my undergrad classes. <laughs> <laughs> I, I feel honored. <laughs> <laughs> That's great. <laughs> I feel honored. But yeah, uh, the, uh, yeah, no, no, I don't know of any. I mean, there's plenty of interesting questions. I mean, you know, if I pose this, probably if you pose it differently, you know, like so it's a whole idea of a productive, kind of productive forest, uh, I bet you there would be tons of people interested in, in that at MIT. I should see if I can get anybody to work on it. There you go. <laughs> Anyone can. <laughs> you will. Um, along that topic, do you, do you have any recommend, recommended reading? Um, I sure do. Profits and recipes. There it is. Ah, perfect. I forgot to put this up there. So uh, this is, uh, I mean, all of these I've used uh, in various forms over the years. Um, uh, you know, the last one is sort of obviously very material science focused, mm -hmm. but uh, I find it interesting also. There's, uh, there's a great book from, uh, RSC, Royal Society of Chemistry, uh, that uh, it's very, very good. Uh, we talked about cooking earlier. Uh, there, I've used this book uh, um, 
on food and cooking, the science and lore of the kitchen. Uh, I have this in my office at MIT. Of course, it's on science of all types of cooking. There's a whole section on chocolate there. Uh, uh, and, uh, and then this, uh, the one by, uh, uh, the one here on the, called the food of the gods is primarily, I guess, a, a historical, um, well, it, you know, the European view, view of history of, of chocolate, uh, you know, or as told by, uh, Europeans, uh, was, is also a really kind of. Uh, good to take a look at. And uh, yeah, so here's the, here's the four I would recommend. Great. Are there any other slides hiding in that presentation that we should take a look at? I don't think so. I think that's it. Thanks. <laughs> um, another question was, can you talk about uh, the importance of not storing chocolate in the refrigerator? Well, that's a really good point. We do not store our chocolate in the refrigerator. There are two reasons to be concerned with doing that, right? Uh, we talked about solid state phase transformations. And so the farther you get below the melting point, the larger the driving force is to transform from one form to another. So that's probably less common problem, but is always a concern when you freeze chocolate. The second, but probably the more common problem is condensation. And uh, the, uh, you know, you can get taking the chocolate out after it's cold, you'll get water to condense on it, particularly in a humid environment, for example, something like that. That's not good for the chocolate because you are, you can, Obviously water and chocolate, you know, water and fat are not good to mix. Um, the, uh, the other thing about modern refrigerators, and this is true of ice cream, Kevin, you'll probably remember that I used to do combine chocolate and ice cream in the lecture. <laughs> and, uh, but similar stability issue with chocolate in, in the refrigerator, modern refrigerators is they have a defrost cycle. So if you happen to put the chocolate or you know, if you're in the freezer, you put the ice cream too far in the back where the coil is, periodically what it's doing is it's cycling up the temperature to vaporize off any water condensate on the coil. And so what you're, actually doing to chocolate and ice cream in that situation is it's not that it's cold it's cycling the temperature not good no. i mean for ice cream it causes also a ripening right. and which grows the crystals again the same type of problem that happens with chocolate right mm -hmm. the crystals grow uh because they're oswald ripening and guess what at the end of the at the end of that process, now you have big crystals in your product, either in the ice cream or in the chocolate, and it tastes gritty. And because you're tasting those rocks. Right. And that's, that's, uh, uh, that's probably the biggest problem with the refrigerator is, uh, <laughs> now you can mitigate that by carefully choosing where you put it, but I still wouldn't, there's no need to, there's not a stability issue or unless you're at a very high temperature, obviously, you know, if it gets too hot in, in, in your house or you put it in the sun, that's not good for chocolate. Obviously, if it gets above 37 C, you're, you're done. <laughs> you lose the temper on the chocolate. <laughs> if I can make one argument for putting it in the refrigerator, when I was an undergrad, I did that. Um, not to preserve the chocolate from the temperature, but it was to preserve it from rodents. Who oh, really? Refrigerator I thought you were going to say preserve it from your roommates. <laughs> <laughs> um, another question, is there a certain taste profile associated with each triglyceride? Um, you know, hmm. No, I don't think so. The flavor constituents are really these things like the phenolic compounds and 
that sort of thing. Uh, they're not, uh, the triglycerides are just a fat part, the, molt, the part that melts and, and releases the flavor constituents. Um, so, you know, I usually get tri- like questions about what is white chocolate? Mm. And the white chocolate is just typically cocoa butter and sugar. And a lot of them, they'll add a milk, dried, you know, milk powder. So there'll be a milk constituent. So it tends to be more like milk chocolate, but it's absent the, uh, it's absent the, you know, the bean part. So they've just extracted the, the fat. And it, you can tell that because yeah, it's, it's white chocolate, but it doesn't taste like chocolate. It's primarily sugar that you're tasting. It's never perfect, right? So you do get some flavor constituents in. So I guess to that extent, it tastes like chocolate, but you're li- missing the vast majority of it because it's really mostly sugar. So I'm not a big fan of white chocolate myself. I, it, I, I can understand people why people would like it, but, but it, to me, it's just too sweet. It's just too much sugar. And I'm just, I don't, I've never had a like sweet tooth. I mean, I, I don't like chocolate because of the, because of the sugar. You know, I like it because of the, the cocoa taste and the fat, right? The creaminess. Right. Um, someone asked in a bar of 85% chocolate, say, what is that remaining 15%? Uh, is, and is there anything uh, healthy in that remainder? Probably sugar. So the 85% is really, you know, like the bitter ones, right? That's, that's has the minimum amount of sugar in it. So it depends. I mean, I guess I would have to say it depends, right? But, but my guess is in your average 85%, it's just very small amount of sugar that's added. And, and can you talk at all about the um, kind of the health benefits of dark chocolate versus milk chocolate versus white chocolate? Yeah, well, this it sort of goes back to, I get that question all the time. I mean, you know, are there authoritative studies on the health benefits? Um, there, I'm, I'm sure if you did a, you know, lit search, you would find somebody trying to do that, but uh Typically, your exposure to chocolate is so limited that it would be hard to conclude that that you do get a you know it'd be really hard to do a a trial, even a retrospective trial that is meaningful. And uh, so, I'm not really I'm not really sure uh, that there are anything known demonstration, but but I but I do know that there are you know. Theobromine is a psychoactive drug. So it does have physiological, biochemical effects on the body. So, but it's similar to, I think, very parallel to caffeine. And there are studies that look at cardiovascular, that have pointed to cardiovascular benefits from ca- caffeine. But I just don't believe that anybody gets exposed to enough theobromine to to really make that, to really find a a real benefit from it. You know, it's it's sort of depends on exposure, right? So there there are, at least as I understand it, there are cardiovascular benefits to to caffeine. Now, the downside of chocolate is you're eating all that fat too. So, which is not always good, depending on your metabolism. If you're a metabolism like mine, probably should keep control of the fats. So, um, at any rate, it's, it's just, I don't think there are anything authoritative to say that there's a benefit to, to eating chocolate. Um, if European chocolate is a blend, what do we get in a standard American chocolate? And do you have any thoughts on the highest quality 
American chocolates? Uh, yeah, I think, so it depends. So, you know, Mars is a big company. Uh, they, you know, if I had to choose, have you ever had Dove bars? That's yes, a really know. good chocolate. Mm -hmm. That's a really good chocolate. Try getting some of those and compare them to the Burdicks. I, you, you will be, you will be impressed. Now it's not like the chocolate that goes in M and M's, right? So that that's you know that's milk chocolate. You know, I've I've been to the the plant in New Jersey. There's I think there's two plants that worldwide that makes all these M and M's, and it's massive. They they took me into what they called the loading dock, was this huge uh, warehouse with train cars coming in from one side then this long train would fit inside and there would be unloading uh, cocoa uh, to go into making M&Ms. And what was the most amazing thing, he, that the, the guy that was giving me the tour said, it was a VIP tour and he goes, he goes, you know, Professor Sima, the interest, it seems like a lot of chocolate. And I said, yeah, he goes, that's only a 12 hour inventory. Oh, wow. <laughs> it's amazing. So yeah, that's a different scale. Uh, and uh, the, uh, but it, try the Dove bar. I, I, I think it's really impressive. I don't know, you know, they don't disclose what they're doing with it, but my guess is that's pretty high grade chocolate. Okay. Um, and then why does a given crystalline form have a range of melting points? For example, you show form 5, 32 to 34 C. Why doesn't a single crystalline form have a single melting point? It's, it, it's only because that's the accuracy that they, melt, that they measured it. The, I, hopefully this person took my class because they, they know that it should just be a single melting point. You're absolutely right. I can tell this is an MIT alum. <laughs> absolutely right. That's just, it's just the, their ability to measure it was limited to that. Right. Um, how does the length of conching affect the taste? Oh, it's huge, right? Because the length of time, I guess, the, I think the way I interpret that, the length of time it yeah. takes to conch. Well, the first two things, it, uh, it reduces the acid content. It's the largest, it's the uh, largest single factor in controlling the acid content of the final product is the conching time. The, uh, in, and as I mentioned, it also controls the water content because there will always be water in this, a natural product, right? So they've got to reduce the water content to uh, a low value. And so th that may not, you may say, well, how does that affect the taste? Well, it affects the viscosity and which allows you, the lower the viscosity allows you to disperse the solids better. So uh, that means they're not agglomerates of the solids in the final product. So it creates a smoother product. So the conching, it doesn't do a lot of change in the particle size. Most of that is done already, but what it does is disperse the particles, get them from being agglomerates to being dispersed in the fat. So they're actually suspended, sort of like an ink. You know, pigments in an ink mm -hmm. have to be dispersed and that's what's happening in the conching process. So it takes time to do that. And they speed it up by adding things like surfactants. So it's one of the areas where they do add it, do do additives to improve that. But generally, they're they're food safe surfactants like lecithin. So it's it's not a, and you don't need much. It's small fractions of a percent of surfactant really affect this process. Great. Well, I know we um, had you till about nine thirty. We have just a few minutes left till that. Do you have any uh, closing thoughts you'd like to share with the group? Yeah, I hope everybody is safe. Uh, I've never worked so hard in my life as I've done from home. <laughs> <laughs>
it's like the weirdest thing. Uh, and, but I, and I probably I'm not the only person on this call that feels that way. Uh, <laughs> Yeah, I don't know what I'm going to do, go, go back to the normal life. I, I, I told somebody today on a call that it's going to be really strange to go to a meeting with shoes on. <laughs> All right, guys. Good night. Thank you so much, Professor Thiem 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 Thiem